and as head of the Department of Medical Gerontology in Trinity College Dublin and a world leader in researching cardiovascular disease and mobility disorders in ageing, our next speaker, Professor Rodan Kenny, is extremely well placed to speak about the biological aspects of ageing. Thank you very much. And, uh... I hope that I'm going to come to you with a partial good news story, something we can do something about. We're going to cover these following topics, why exercise is good for you, whether or not it plays a role in incident dementia, whether or not it plays a role in established dementia. Of course, one of the consequences of exercise is, is less falls or no exercise is falls. We're going to talk about falls and dementia, a common problem. Falls and low blood pressure, something we can do something about and possibly low blood pressure and dementia if we've time to cover it. The role of exercise in keeping us, us good uh, in mind and body has been known for some long period of time. And this is a quote from good old Plato. I have a son studying classics, so he's constantly throwing these quotes at me. <clears throat> there are three components to physical exercise and physical activity. Strength, endurance, and flexibility. And a good exercise program, good exercise, covers all of these different components. And we know from vast amounts of literature that exercise is good for body in that it prevents osteoporosis, bone thinning, fractures, very good for cardiovascular disease, the heart, diabetes, uh, blood pressure, strokes, other cerebrovascular disease, cancers, gut cancer particularly, and prevents fractures. And the focus of today's talk is going to be how exercise can prevent falls and the relevance of this in the context of dementia or risk factors for dementia. So let's just start with physical exercise and preservation of brain function for all of us in the room. The biological plausible hypothesis behind this is that exercise improves blood flow in the brain, cerebral blood flow, and oxygen delivery, therefore it delivers nutrition to the functioning cells of the brain, and also induces fibroblast uh, growth in the areas related particularly to memory, the hippocampus. And I'm just referring to one group's excellent work on this. There are another number of groups who have studied this. Art Kramer's group has looked at this in detail and remarkably has shown that um, exercise, uh, exercise uh, uh, at, at six and 12 months after stopping exercise uh, was associated with an increase in the volume of the hippocampus, the memory center, which is here. So the volume of the hippocampus increased even as soon as six months after an exercise program. And that was true for right and left-sided hippocampuses. And this slide just gives you a sense of the effect size of exercise on some of the domains it's beneficial for. Planning, executive function is the formal terminology for that, but our ability to plan, our memory, and reaction times, and it's some sense of the, of the scale of those differences for, those for exercise compared to um, sedentary. So is exercise associated with a reduction in the risk of getting dementia? If we were to exercise vigorously for the next X odd years, would it reduce our incidence of dementia? And the bottom line is yes, not dramatically, but yes. And in, in this study of 1,700 people who started out without any evidence of cognitive impairment, a population study, followed up for an average of about six years, uh, 158 developed dementia, of whom 107 had Alzheimer's disease. The uh, proportions of those who developed dementia versus those who did not uh, was significantly different for the exercise group compared to the, uh, who exercise more than three times a week compared to those who didn't exercise as frequently as three times a week. So, you know, that's not too arduous, half an hour, three times a week, and these were the data. And this just is a, another way of explaining that data, the uh, Kaplan-Meier estimates for the probability of being dementia-free um, from the... Uh, from when the participants started, the age that they started the study, through to the time when the uh, dementia developed. And as you can see, you're much 
more likely to be, you are more likely, not much, are more likely to be dementia free if you exercise three times a week. A different way of actually showing that sort of data. So that's one of a number of studies illustrating that there is evidence that physical activity in midlife and later can reduce the incidence of dementia. Um, there's also the, oh, constantly the confounder of, well, genetic predisposition and how do we control for that? And it's very much more difficult, but the Swedes have a very nice um, Swedes, twin study in which they've addressed a number of different issues, one of which is the role of modification of mid-life uh, behaviours, lifestyle behaviours and outcome in particular with respect to dementia. And they controlled for age, sex, education, diet, smoking, alcohol, body mass index and angina and, and also were able to show in these twin studies that light exercise such as gardening or walking, walking was associated with a reduced incidence of dementia at follow up but that regular exercise, more intense exercise involving sports reduced the odds of dementia even more. So some suggestion there that yes, exercise is good, but there's actually a gradient of exercise associated with incident dementia. So that's the good news. Now, the, 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 this is the kind of cautionary tale. And this was a recent group um, from the NIH who looked at this this same exercise, and we won't go into the detail in too much, but to know that they had very strict criteria, um, minimum of 300 participants in the study, 50 years and above, minimum of two years from the um, onset, from the inclusion to whatever the outcome measure was, etc. Uh, a large meta-analysis, and this is just from last year, published in archives, and they did show that what we, what we know from other data, and we, we thought we believed that diabetes and high lipids in, in midlife and tobacco smoking did increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. They showed also that Mediterranean type diet and folic acid and low or moderate alcohol intake and cognitive activities and physical activity reduced the, the risk of incident dementia. But the quality of the evidence they, they stress is low for all of the associations. So there's a heck of a lot more going on in dementia over and above these traditional risk factors. Nonetheless, there was an association. So the summary of exercise and the brain is that even modest programs do improve memory, attention and decision making in people who are cognitively normal and that that benefit is from children right through to older adults. Uh, the cognitive benefits are supported by other research showing increase in brain blood flow during exercise, changes in brain volumes, which is pretty remarkable when you think about it, and, and improved brain function, objective brain function. And there is evidence that there, these benefits are apparent in early Alzheimer's disease, early dementias, Parkinson's disease, and to a lesser extent, multiple sclerosis. So that's that first bit. Exercise is good in, in cognitive impairment. What about or in, in, in non-cognitively impaired cohorts? Right. What about exercise in the context of cognitive impairment and dementia? Um, and I've just chosen one meta-analysis again to give a flavor of the, of the tone of this research. Of 2,000 odd participants with with dementia who had participated in 30 randomized controlled trials and, and they, these were the ones which met the criteria that the researchers were, were looking for. And the bottom line was that exercise programs, and the exercise programs of course are heterogeneous from these meta-analyses, they're not the one same exercise programs, but in general exercise programs influenced beneficially in people with established dementia strength, physical fitness, functional performance, their ability to carry on activities of daily living, cognitive performance, and behavior. Behavior. And, and there was quite a significant impact when you compared the exercise cohorts with the non-exercise cohorts in terms of the effect size of the effect of, of exercise. So that's, that, I think, is, is a positive 
message from this, this proposed program of exercise and fitness in the context of cognitive impairment and dementia. So they concluded that training does increase fitness, physical function, and positive behavior. Now, how often do we prescribe exercise programs for patients with cognitive impairment who have got behavioral problems? And another group has taken this further in terms of a, a, a proposed randomized control trial which is taking place now in the UK and their primary outcome is to look at behavior and psychological symptoms of dementia in response to exercise. So half of those randomized, of the 146 participants, will be randomized to an exercise program. And very important with exercise in cognitive impairment dementia, as we've discovered from our Newcastle studies, is compliance. So they've built in good compliance and supervision of compliance and assistance with compliance, not just handing an exercise program to somebody and expecting them to do it, but therapists actually working with people People, walking with people, walking with carers and helping in that context. And finally, I, I just want to mention a, 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 a study from uh, someone in the, in the States who we hope will be joining us shortly in the TILDA study, um, who, who showed as a result of his work that exercise can have a significant impact on depression. And there is some emerging evidence that depression in the context of cognitive impairment and dementia also benefits from exercise. 150 minutes of pretty intense exercise a week was employed by this particular study. So 30 minutes, five days a week. Well, most of us are of the frame, I'm afraid of, of Woody Allen. You can live to be 100 if you give up all of the things that make you want to live to be 100. <laughs> okay, so what about falls in dementia? They're, they're very, very common. And there's been actually remarkably little in this area, given how important they are and what a big impact they have on quality of life and, and care. And, and, and some studies have suggested that falls is the commonest single reason for patients with cognitive impairment or dementia to be admitted to institutional care. Once people start falling, then it becomes very difficult to provide care. And as you can see, there is, a, again, a gradient in, in the numbers of falls depending on the type of dementia. So um, these are, there's a nine-fold increase in falls in people with dementia, and then it's much more common in dementia associated with Parkinson's disease. Next, common in, in patients who've got Lewy body dementia, dementia of the Lewy body type less so in vascular and Alzheimer's disease, but still a threefold increase in vascular and Alzheimer's disease. And I was involved in, in some of this work, uh, all, the, all of the work I'm going to share with you now, when I was uh, in Newcastle up until five years ago. Louise Allen and Clive Ballard uh, were the co-authors. And basically we did at that time a study of 289 people who had presented to the service who, with, with dementia to try and establish what are the risk factors for falls in dementia? There have been copious studies looking at risk factors for falls in people who don't have cognitive impairment and dementia, but is that the same for dementia? What are the risk factors in populations with dementia? And then are any of them modifiable? Can we do something to modify those risk factors and prevent falls in these cohorts? And so we studied uh, case controls, patients with Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, and patients with Parkinson's disease and dementia. Did a very uh, extensive baseline assessment of all possible risk factors known in non-demented uh, cohorts, and then followed people up every uh, uh, week with weekly diaries for a total of, of one year. And again, this confirms what, 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 what I've shown you earlier on in the table, that patients with Parkinson's disease are much more likely to fall, less likely so uh, with uh, DLB, but still very, very common. This is the time in days to the first fall, um, uh, vascular, Alzheimer's, and the case control. So falls very common, and that's just another way of showing the, the data. And one of the commonest causes or associations of falls in this group. And now I'm going to come on to how difficult it is actually to tease out the attributable cause of falls in someone with dementia. 
even in older people, it's often very difficult because we're not there at the time. And they very rarely will have a monitor. And the vast majority, 80%, aren't even witnessed. So you don't even have someone to describe, this is what happened when that person fell. So, so one of the areas that we've been looking at is blood pressure behavior in dementia and how this might contribute to falls in people with dementia. And we can see from these sort of measurements that when someone is lying down and then stands, this is my ex-research director, I assure you. He's <laughs> that there is a change in all of us. All of us, if we stood up now, our blood pressure would drop transiently. But it comes back to normal very quickly. And more and more of our information or our research, including from Tilda, is showing us that actually the length of time it takes to return to normal, because that determines how quickly the blood flow is going to continue pumping through your brain and feeding your brain, that that actually correlates with a lot of, of cognitive tasks and certainly with fall rates in everybody. Now, does it do so in people with dementia? And when we looked at that in this study, in the Newcastle study, we found that there were a lot of non-modifiable causes that, you know, you couldn't modify, you couldn't do anything about being a man, I'm afraid, male gender. <laughs> Um, the duration of dementia, um, the, 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 the resident, whether they were in a care home or not, their CAMCOG score, the history of recurrent falls, but there were modifiable risk factors. Or indeed, certainly we know from studies in non-demented people, these are modifiable risk factors, such as cardiovascular medications. Um, I just want to pause here to tell you that in non-demented people in Ireland, 50% of people over the age of 70 are on polypharmacy. That's huge. And only 15% of prescriptions in Ireland are generic. I'm using every possible opportunity to share that with audiences because I think there's an opportunity to here to cost save if we can redress even marginally that balance of cost. Um, and it was particularly so in people with cognitive impairment and dementia in the UK, and I'm sure it's the case in Ireland. The studies just haven't been done on, on, on the burden and the volume of medications in, in care. Psychotropic medications, gait, physical activity, their depression scores, autonomic scores, etc., so, and blood pressure behavior. So all of these on univariate analysis were risk factors, modifiable risk factors for dementia. On multivariate analysis, symptomatic orthostatic blood pressure, these are people with established dementia, was common and was a significant risk factor for falls in these people. So that can be modified, that can be treated. I won't go into how now, but that is a modifiable risk factor. But you need to diagnose this and you pretty much need to use that sort of technology to diagnose it. It's not rocket science, but it needs to be done. Autonomic scores, that's the nervous system which controls our blood pressure and our heart rate behavior. They were also a risk factor for falls, as was depression, as was higher levels of physical activity, was, which was prote protective. So we're back again to exercise. And when you think about it, when we move through the environment, there are a whole lot of extraneous forces determining our movement, determining our staying upright. And in the context of neurodegenerative disease, of course, these will become confused, sensory confusion from all of the, all of the sensory signals we're, we're, we're getting. And then that's, that's further compounded if you're intermittently dropping your blood pressure, you're not getting enough of flow, and therefore the interpretation is going to become even more muzzy, or in depression, or physical activity isn't good, or, or in the context of autonomic dysfunction. So, um, a, a word of, of caution for those who are involved in looking after patients with dementia in care facilities. This study clearly showed that the time when participants were most at risk of falling were shortly after their admission or if they were transferred uh, from one ward to another. And certainly in the hospital context, I don't think we realize that sufficiently and, and I'm just putting that note of caution out there. Falls are incredibly common in older people in the emergency room. 45% of people who attend, over 65, attend because of a fall. Nearly half of all people over 65. And if you look at the breakdown of those, 25% have cognitive impairment and dementia. 
Now, this was a very rigorous study which we did in Newcastle at the time where there was a research presence in the emergency room 24-7 for a year. And everybody over the age of 50 was, 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 was interviewed, asked why they had come. If they'd come because of a fall, then they, we went into the history in more detail. So, so this, is, this is very good data. But a quarter of people who come to the emergency room come because of have cognitive impairment. And we found that cardiovascular causes of falls, possible causes of falls, were very common. 60% of, of these people had a possible low blood pressure or slow heart rate cause. They never get reviewed in clinical practice in the main in, in, in this context. So this is certainly an area that we can do something about to prevent subsequent falls and treat, and treat these people. And, and syncope is the Greek for loss of tone. It means a collapse. We all know what it's like, a faint, a collapse. A fall is, is also falling to the ground, but without syncope, without collapse. However, in people with dementia, if it's not witnessed, and you don't recall having blacked out, you're going to present with a fall. And yet, if you've blacked out, the vast majority of causes of black, blackouts are treatable. So this is a group of patients in whom we know from other research are not being diagnosed for treatable causes. And actually, the psychotropic and cardiovascular medications that these people are on actually increase the likelihood of having some hypotension or bradycardia. And you can see here, uh, this was a study we did in people with Lewy body dementia where we did carotid sinus massage and 40% of them had this abnormal response which is a common cause of falls or blackouts where the heart slows down for a period of time and or the blood pressure drops. And this poor man had had 10 falls and four fractures before he was referred on for, for proper assessment. And simple massage over the gland in the neck, which is the most important organ in, in the body and controls our heart rate and blood pressure when all of us are moving around, um, resulted in this ECG, which shows his heart stops after massage for 10 seconds. He lost consciousness. We witnessed it. He came around and he said, oh, that's how I feel when I've got a fall. He denied losing consciousness. So we were able to show it experimentally that this is what was happening when he was falling. And his blood pressure, likewise, this is a beat-to-beat -beat blood pressure trace using the same equipment as we use in the clinic and in Tilda, showed a very marked drop, no blood pressure at all for a period of time. So no brain flow and of course he lost consciousness. So that and also arrhythmias, irregularities of the heart are common in these, in these patients and yet not, not, uh, not diagnosed frequently enough. So think of the importance of witness accounts, if possible, in, in older people with cognitive impairment and falls. And if you're suspicious at all, have them properly assessed. I, I, I would recommend have a, a comprehensive medical assessment for a possible cause. So we, uh, I want to just share with you one last um, series of, of slides in my last minute. We know that hypotension is a risk factor for cognitive impairment and dementia. That's been shown from a number of studies. And in Ireland, we're now looking at that in the context of mild cognitive impairment. And we know there's a lot of overlap between so-called Alzheimer's disease, per se, pure, and vascular dementia. And we hypothesize that intermittent drops in blood pressure, as you've seen in the videos, actually lead to poor perfusion in the brain, and that that triggers a cascade of abnormal neuronal activity, which ultimately leads to dementia and, and triggers a number of the pathways we know are associated with this. So we're following people funded by the HRB for a five-year period who have mild cognitive impairment, detailed cognitive assessment tests, and cardiovascular tests. And we have found that significant autonomic dysfunction, that's the nerves that control blood pressure and heart rate, is present in these people compared to controls who don't have cognitive impairment. Now, of course, the question is, and that's why we're following them, is this a determinant of conversion from cognitive impairment to dementia? And we also know that orthostatic hypotension drops in blood pressure when people stand up are excessive in people with mild cognitive impairment. And the degree of drop is associated with the degree of impairment. So suggesting some causal association, but we'll be able to show that longitudinally. 
And finally, in 9,000 odd people, we're looking at the cognitive tests and blood pressure behavior uh, longitudinally again. Every two years, these people are being studied. And you can see here that the degree of drop in blood pressure as people get older, the, sorry, the degree of the ability to, for blood pressure to return to normal after people stand up declines significantly as they get older. And we're finding that this, this failure to return to normal for a long period of time or a longer period of time correlates with impaired cognition or impaired uh, performance in the cognitive tasks. So, We've, we've covered the value of exercise for the brain. We've covered the potential value of physical activity in dementia, um, certainly in falls prevention, and the importance of thinking of, of the complexity of falls, causes of falls in people with cognitive impairment and dementia, and trying to ensure that these people get an appropriate assessments to prevent subsequent events. Thank you.